Good morning. It is August 19th, 2022, and this is the OSU Turfgrass Team Times. And for a majority of you uh, on the professional side of the industry, you've probably been wondering for the last week what the hell happened this summer. Um, I think for the most part, it's been a, a almost glorious August, and uh, it's nearly caused us to have a boring situation. Um, temperatures have kind of ret returned to something of uh, abnormally cool. Um, we've had some moisture. Maybe conditions have dried out for some of us, but I see uh, that the forecast brings uh, potential for moisture into the weekend and early part of next week, at least for Northern Ohio. Um, even soil temperatures uh, in Northern Ohio at that two inch depth on a modified sand grain are down at 70 degrees. And uh, that definitely is not a normal August temperature from my standpoint. Uh, disease wise, uh, problems have started to see uh, dramatic reductions. Dollar spot has ramped up, but the brown patch pythium issues uh, have dissipated. And so we were really starting to see some uh, level of comfort from the standpoint of management. Um, online today, we've got Dr. Dave Gardner, Dr. Dominic Petrella, and Dr. Dave Shetler with the first of the pestilence reports, Dr. Gardner and Weeds. Good morning, everybody. So yes, let's talk a little bit about weed control. Um, if you are seeing this, then, well, you've got a crabgrass issue. And the good news is, is that um, by the time crabgrass goes to seed, it becomes relatively easy to control with herbicides. The bad news is, is that, well, if you see this, that means that you're probably going to have the problem again next year because, you know, like you have seed that's going to fall into the soil. And pretty much where you have crabgrass this year, you can expect that you probably have crabgrass next year as well. But the nice thing about crabgrass in this stage is that it becomes relatively easier to control with herbicides. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, I talked about using mixtures of quinclorac and topramazone or quinclorac and mesotrione. Um, in order to try to combat the crabgrass, but by this point, it becomes easier to control with either of those herbicides applied alone. Um, at this point, though, you want to make sure to keep things well mowed so that you reduce the seed head development. Um, and uh, also, you know, like if you do see seed heads, uh, just keep in mind where the crabgrass is. Um, yeah, you can see some movement of the seed, but for the most part, um, the um, easiest path is for it to drop straight down um, from where that inflorescence is now. So my point is, is where you have crabgrass now is where you might want to focus on putting out a pre-emergence herbicide, um, you know, in the middle of April next year. Now, on the other hand, if you had applied, for example, quinclorac and you weren't entirely satisfied with your control, it might be that it wasn't even crabgrass that you were having a problem with. So I guess at least here in central Ohio, I'm noting an unusual amount of goosegrass relative to years past. And so that's a species that sometimes can be confused with crabgrass. It's got a little bit different growth habit that results in this bleached out silvery region at the point of attachment to the soil. So sometimes this is called silver crabgrass, but when it blooms, rather than having individual florets, it's uh, groups of flowers. Um, and so that's one easy way to uh, differentiate these two. So if you have goosegrass instead of crabgrass, quinclorac is not effective on goosegrass. And so you'd want to use either topramazone or um, the old standby phenoxaprop is actually pretty effective on goosegrass as well. Again, you would want to mow to uh, reduce the seed head development and recognize that if you have a goosegrass issue that that is a plant that germinates a little bit later than crabgrass. So you know how we usually say, um, to optimize crabgrass control with a pre-emergence herbicide, put that out in the middle of April. Um, with goosegrass, you should apply that pre-emergence a little bit later in the season, um, late April, even early May. Um, prodiamine is a good choice, but then after that, oxidiazon, Chipko Ronstar is an example brand name. Um, my point is, is that there's actually different pre-emergence herbicides that are recommended for goosegrass compared to crabgrass. So again, if you have a goosegrass issue, um, you know, there's ways to control it now, but then um, be planning to also uh, try to control that with a pre-emergence herbicide next year. If you had a problem with any of these weeds um, in the spring, these are all winter annual broadleaf weeds. And uh, if you had trouble controlling those with a post-emergence herbicide, I feel your pain. Um, I have done trials uh, at uh, our research center on these uh, weeds in, uh, you know, like the middle of May, 
Um, and sometimes it can be very difficult to control, uh, you know, after they've hardened off due to wintertime uh, stress. And so uh, one thing that you can try is, you know, recognize that these are annual plants that are coming from seed, but they'll start to germinate in September and October. So where you had a severe problem with these, you can consider putting out a pre-emergent herbicide. Check the label, but most of our pre-emergent herbicides that we use for crabgrass control on the label also have a list of annual broadleaf weeds and usually included are the winter annuals. And so, you know, in areas where winter annual broadleaves are problematic for you, um, generally speaking, pre-emergence can be a more effective strategy than attempting to control post-emergence in the fall, which is actually more effective than trying to control post-emergence when they become really noticeable next spring. So again, if you had a problem with those, plants in April and May, um, now's not a bad time to start thinking about trying to uh, um, eliminate those either with a pre-emergence in September or a post-emergence application in October or November. Finally, I was going to point out that September is in fact the best time to seed cool season grasses agronomically. Um, breaks my heart every year. I get an email from somebody that says, yeah, um, I had a landscaper come in and round up my whole property and they seeded, uh, you know, like May 15th. And it's like, that's, that's, you know, about the worst time, you know, mostly when I do that at the OTF center, I end up with uh, like 90% crabgrass and 10% perennial rye or 100% crabgrass and 0% Kentucky bluegrass. So fall agronomically is the best time to uh, um, do that seeding. So um, know that you have until about September 15th to get down Kentucky bluegrass, all of the other cool season species um, by September 30th, but I'll talk more in the coming weeks, uh, and I think some others are going to mention some things about that today too, but um, now's the time if you're going to be applying a non-selective herbicide, um, now is the time to be doing that um, so that uh, you have potentially time for a second application should that be necessary. Ed, that's what I have for this week. Thank you, Dr. Gardner. We're all going to get covered in weeds. Dr. Petrella, give us an update on your end, please. All right, so this morning, um, this ties, in, ties into uh, what uh, Dr. Gardner was talking about. These are some research trials that we're gonna be establishing all across the state this fall. Um, th this is something I really wanted to do when I first came here was uh, expand our research presence all across Ohio for two reasons. We get good data when a trial is in Northwest Ohio and Columbus, but we also are able to then showcase these to all of our stakeholders. So we can get different groups of stakeholders in Northwest Ohio compared to Cincinnati. So the first thing I'll say is these trials are going to be open to anybody to come see, whether we're having it at a field day, or if you want to go out and see different cultivars and different nitrogen rates, you be able to stop by. So the main point of this project is to update nitrogen fertilizer recommendations for high cut turf. That can be high cut turf for a lawn, high cut turf for athletic field, uh, the rough for a golf course, you name it. But our goal is to see how much we can reduce annual nitrogen needs uh, on high cut turf across the entire state. Simply because nitrogen needs down in Cincinnati and ryegrass, they're probably different from the nitrogen needs of ryegrass up, up near Toledo, okay? Um, we're gonna be treating these plots with no nitrogen, all the way up to four pounds of nitrogen per thousand square feet annually. Okay, we're probably going to use coated urea. We still haven't made all the decisions yet in that, those applications. Uh, the big thing then is too, we're looking at four different species. Uh, so Kentucky bluegrass, perennial rye, tall fescue, and hard fescue. Um, generally, you're not going to. Most people wouldn't see a pure hard fescue lawn in Ohio, uh, but based on some, based on my my experiences, there's going to be certain parts of Ohio where if you have a really low input lawn that gets very little traffic, hard fescue is actually going to probably be not too bad. So we want to see how well it does across the state. So cooperators from um, all the seed, seed uh, industry, seed breeders, they're donating a bunch of seeds. So I just thank them first and foremost. So you can see the cultivars that we're planning on using. Some of these might change. Uh, bluegrass, Bewitched, Pro Vista, Blue Note, Mercury, and Moonlight SLT. Uh, or these are the uh, American um, compact Kentucky bluegrasses. So those of you that don't know, there's different types of Kentucky bluegrasses, some that are ultra dwarf, uh, some that are a little taller, uh, some that yield more than others. So these are kind of the middle of the road bluegrasses that are used in different types of high cut turfs, not just lawns, but also athletic fields. Uh, all of these also have some older varieties to use as a baseline. So 
something like Barlenium perennial ryegrass versus something like silver sport perennial ryegrass. We're looking at looking to see if newer varieties that have been bred in the last like few years, how their nitrogen needs might actually compare to some of the older varieties. So perennial ryegrass, we're going to have Barlenium, Fastball, Manhattan, Silver Sport, and Mighty. Tall Fescue, Hemi is going to be one of our older varieties, including Raptor 3, Zion, Grande 3, and Bonfire. And for Hard Fescue, Beacon, a brand new variety coming out from Columbia called Tenacious, Minimus, Nanook, and Soar 2. So the big thing is all these varieties, they'll be back to back to back right next to each other. So you'll be able to see how the Kentucky bluegrass grows at half a pound versus tall fescue at half a pound right next to each other. This would be great for especially homeowners. If homeowners want to see what they expect if they're going to put no nitrogen out on tall fescue versus Kentucky bluegrass, they're going to be able to see it. So we are establishing this at four different sites across the state. So the first I'll talk about is Blue Ash Golf Course in Blue Ash, Ohio. Uh, so Blue Ash is just uh, inside the inner belt uh, north of downtown Cincinnati. So I wait to say this is the, in the armpit of Ohio where it gets hot and sweaty. Okay, so we'll be pushing some of these to their limits. So this is a perfect site. This is right next to the golf course shop, but it's also, this golf course is residential. There's houses across it. In this area that I've outlined here, it's right next to a walking path that people use. So these are going to be signed with nitrogen rates. They're going to be signed with species and cultivars. So people walk by and be able to see the impact of low nitrogen on different species. We're also putting this up at the Northwest Agricultural Research Station. Uh, this is in Custer, Ohio, but it's halfway in between Finley and Bowling Green. Uh, they have very different soils up in this region. So with this being across the state, we'll be able to see the impact of different soils. Uh, this soil is very high in clay with very little organic matter. Um, again, we're going to get different people visiting these sites. So people that are a little bit more remote, they might be, be establishing large lawn areas, let's say if they're a farmer, uh, around their homestead. So again, different sites, different clientele, different environments. We'll be established on campus here at Worcester at our Ohio State ATI campus. This one I want to point out that we're going to have a little fall field day this fall and we'll be showcase, showcasing this. So if you want to come out and look at different establishment rates. So I can take say for a fact, some hard fescues establish faster than others. So we'll be able to show you whether or not that happens. And then last but not least, we'll be putting this to the Ohio Turf Grass Foundation Research Center down in Columbus. Uh, and this will be a, a showcase for next year's field days, both OTF and OCA field days. But also, uh, we will be getting funding for this for Master Gardeners specifically. So we'll be having Master Gardener specific field days for these events to really expand our network for uh, incorporating low input turf into uh, any turf situation. So we'll be establishing, like Dr. Gardner was talking about, we'll be establishing these in mid to late September. Uh, all of these sites have been uh, sprayed with a non-selective herbicide to start killing off the existing turf. Uh, we'll be tilling that surface in. And then next year, we'll be starting fertilizer treatments about late May to early June, okay? All plots will be signed. So we'll be having uh, the area of one pound of nitrogen will be signed off compared to the area of four pounds of nitrogen. And we'll be signing specific species so people will be able to ID them a little bit easier. At each site, we'll have a QR code that links to a plot map. So you'll be able to get your plot map, be able to see where exactly everything is and a blog about the trial as it goes on for uh, uh, two to three years. And then I'll go ahead and end with that. Thank you, Dr. Petrella. That was a very interesting research update. So other activity on the research front, um, uh, construction of a, a new pudding green surface with 10 new cultivars or 12 new cultivars of creeping bank grass. Uh, is about to um, uh, initiate here in Worcester. And there is also discussion of updating uh, the putting height turf surfaces in Columbus as well to uh, bring the cultivars up to a modern level um, from the standpoint of uh, activity and collaborative activity, both Dr. Gardner and myself have been working on organic weed control um, options. And so that's something to keep an eye out for going forward. Um, and just following up on Dr. Gardner's comment, there is a set of videos on our YouTube channel, uh, and it goes from step one through five. Uh, one of our former colleagues, Dr. Zane Roddenbush, did an excellent job on uh, 
uh, loan establishment. And he goes through the processes that you should be considering, seed selection, how to apply various materials, uh, timing of seeding, irrigation practices, post seeding, fertility practices, uh, all the way through to that first and second cut. So uh, if you're looking for more information on that, please feel free to take uh, take advantage of it. Now, last but not least, but I would say he's somewhat disappointed in the amount of damage that the insects have caused this year compared to last year. I think Dr. Shetler would agree. Last year was almost a banner year. Uh, <laughs> Dave Shetler, Bug Doc, is here. And uh, take it away. Thanks, uh, Ed. The uh, this year, uh, in the last week and a half, uh, the only inquiries I've had are from golf course superintendents that are beginning to see uh, cutworm damage on their greens and tees. Uh, and of course, uh, I have to roll my eyes. I suspect these are ones that have not used uh, uh, a celeprin earlier in the season, uh, because usually if you use a celeprin in May or June, at its full label rate, you'll get season long control of caterpillars uh, for the rest of the season. And it's one of the things I've always recommended uh, specifically for golf course greens and tees. I know you might not be able to afford a celebrant for the entire golf course. Uh, you could use a cheaper uh, neonicotinoid for white grubs on your fairways, uh, but uh, you, you ought to protect those greens and tees, uh, consider a celebrant. Uh, if you didn't use a celebrin, again, any of our pyrethroids seem to be doing pretty well. Uh, I had a superintendent uh, just this last week that, that said, uh, uh, I've still got some scimitar, but I don't have pyfenthrin. Uh, will scimitar work? I had to chuckle. Scimitar is actually better uh, than bifenthrin. It's just a little bit more expensive. Uh, and, and so uh, since, you know, bifenthrin is kind of the ubiquitous uh, generic uh, out there. It's it's one of the cheapest of the pyrethroids, but there are many other pyrethroids. Uh, virtually all of them are really good on caterpillars. Uh, I also do want to point out that uh, we haven't received any complaints, any sightings of any major fall army worm uh, this season, and and that's what I expected because my colleagues down in the southern states haven't said a thing about them other than an occasional, uh, uh, yeah, we had them in, in this uh, forage field, uh, but that was about it. Uh, I, I mentioned them because we did get uh, a few of them flying up uh, this month uh, in the pheromone traps, not, not any large numbers, uh, but traditionally, if you get what appears to be cutworm damage in September, when I've gone out and done a, a soap flush, uh, up comes fall armyworm. And it's kind of interesting when fall armyworm is in very low numbers, it acts like the black cutworm. Uh, it's only in high numbers that it mows the turf down and eats everything down to the crown. Uh, and, and so I think we're back to normal this year. When it comes to the white grubs, uh, I don't think we're gonna see much damage across Ohio, though I've been told by some of my colleagues that uh, over in the Lima to Finley area, they've seen more Japanese beetles than they've ever seen in their life. Uh, and, and when I hear that kind of uh, message, uh, those Japanese beetle females have got to lay their eggs somewhere. Uh, and they're going to search for green turf grass. Uh, they have a really good ability to, to see green uh, and they're going to go into the green. When they dig down, they're actually going to assess the soil moisture and the organic content. Uh, and, and so they're going to dump their eggs where there's moist soil and good organic content. What does that mean to you as a turf manager? If you kept your turf grass green during this period of time and it's been well fertilized, that's going to be the place that the Japanese beetles uh, dump their eggs. Now, I know the, the sort of Western and Northwestern areas, there's not all that many irrigated lawns out there, but there's a few of them. There, there's some people that have some nice real estate they put in irrigation systems. Those are the ones that are gonna be at highest risk of potentially having white grubs, as well as, as our uh, sport turf and, and golf course managers that normally keep their uh, turf grass green with irrigation. So. Uh, be on the lookout. Uh, we're still about a month away from when you might actually see grub damage. Uh, 
but now would be a time the the second end stars are there. And if you use a, a cup changer to pull a plug and, and check the, the turf, you should be able to easily see those second and star white grubs and do a, a curative treatment uh, if needed. That's all I've got for the insect report, but I've got a question to you agronomists. Uh, the bug doc is a real fan of turf type tall fescues. And at least what I heard is that Turf type tall fescues, if planted fairly late in the season, might not uh, reach maturity and harden off and can get some winter kill. So I, that's my question. Uh, what would be your, your latest time of putting in turf type tall fescues? Dr. Petrella, we were just talking about this. <laughs> yeah, 100%. Um, I late seeded some tall fescue a couple of years ago, and this was now this is central, you know, south central Minnesota in Twin Cities, uh, and we seeded this about mid October. There was a bunch of winter kill. <laughs> there was no winter kill in the ryegrass. There was no winter quill kill in the fine fescues. Um, all of it recovered uh, in about by by July. Uh, in Ohio, like the, you know, Dr. Gardner was talking about earlier, September 30th being that cutoff date, I would definitely say that you don't want to see tall fescue into October. Um, maybe down in southern Ohio, you might get away with it if you have a decent winter, but you want to keep it mid to early September to let it establish so you avoid any winter kill. Thank you. I would say, I would say from personal experience, Dr. Scheller, uh, mid-September to late September is really, really good time to do it. Um, if you've got the warm weather, it, you can get a, a, a lawn up in seven days and look like you know what you're doing. A um, couple other things to wrap up on. Um, we've just kind of wrapped up the, and there's a double wrap up, lovely. Uh, there's a triple one. Um, we just finished our scheduling and programming for the OTF conference at show in December. And I must say, I think from a personal standpoint, it's probably one of the best shows we put together. Uh, Steve McDonald's coming in, Michelle DeCosta's coming in. Um, we have a range of uh, stuff, including uh, shop tours for the equipment managers. Um, we've got a panel with some of our, uh, veteran industry leaders in the lawn care industry talking about uh, sustaining a business model and, and successfully putting uh, material out there. Dr. Chase Straw is coming in on the sports turf side of it. Uh, Dr. Mike Richardson is coming in from Arkansas. Um, for those of you who have been waited, waiting to hear from, from with bated breath. Um, and we've also got the likes of Greg Boring coming in from Baltusrol uh, and many other very interesting topics. There is, it looks like two pre-conference dates uh, on the Monday. So one is more focused on business and budgeting and career development. And the second one, as it currently stands, has um, an area focused on baseball infield and baseball field management. Uh, and we will get greater confirmation or more confirmation on that in the coming weeks. Um, other things coming up, the OTF scholarship outing is early October. And then the OSU ATI scholarship outing is October 19th, and we will coincide that with the field day on campus in the morning and then over to Worcester Country Club after that. Um, classes do start next week, so we will be back, but do expect that any of the teaching faculty may have a shell shock face of like, what happened? Um, and that will be getting close to the end of the weekly events, so next week and then maybe the week after. Uh, my colleagues here didn't know I was thinking this, but potentially the week after we might do a Turf Team Times Live uh, for industry to kind of come in and pick over the bones of the summer. Uh, and we'll go through some of the uh, things we learned. On a final note, uh, we are moving on on the hiring process. Um, and so there will be, I would expect in the next six to eight weeks, announcements on at least one of the positions, hopefully. Um, and we should be starting to regrow the ranks and build, build the team back to where it needs to be. So with that, uh, we will say thank you. One last thing I did forget. We had a question from Master Gardner this week. 
Dr. Gardner, Dr. Gardner and myself are going to embark on a study looking at the impacts of no more May next fall, next spring. Uh, this is something that's gaining momentum. I want to know whether there is anything detrimental about it or it's something that we're just going to have to live with. Um, so thank you, Master Gardner, for pointing out that we probably need to do something. And uh, we are embarking on that piece of work. Thank you. And we'll talk to you all next week.